Hello, welcome to the World Economic Forum East Asia. I'm Martin Sung. We're here with a panel of experts uh, today to talk about uh, one simple but very big question, and that is growth. How are we going to get more of it? Where is it going to come from? And what can governments and also the private sector do to ensure that that happens? Let's get right down to it and uh, start with uh, the Philippine Finance Secretary, Cesar Purissima. And uh, good to see you. Nice I think we were talking what, about just 24 hours ago, so we're, yeah. getting, we're spending a lot of uh, good time together. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you had a, a piece in the Asian Journal, uh, just I think it was a, a day ago, where you said that, look, growth is fine, but more to the point, you need growth plus structural reforms equals sustainable and inclusive growth. This is what we really need. But you lamented the fact that in terms of reforms, structural reforms, you're sensing a bit of, uh, I guess, slippage or stalling, and you said, look, that's, that's a darn shame. Let me ask you, give me, give me examples. How and where are you sensing stalling and slippage in terms of reforms? Well, before I give you examples, uh, as you know, Martin, growth is not preordained. It is something we need to work on. The good thing about Asia is there's a lot of things going for us. Uh, young demography, right location, right beside China, natural resources, some of the countries around us as natural uh, resources. But we need to do many things to make sure that it becomes a reality. First, infrastructure. We need to make sure that we invest in infrastructure because we need to be better connected with, with each other. Uh, ADB estimates uh, we need about $8 trillion over the next uh, 10 years. Uh, we have the money in the region. This is a capital surplus uh, uh, region. But we need to make our financial markets more efficient and more connected and seamless. Because if not, we have to keep sending our money outside the region. And then uh, that's when it becomes an issue uh, for us. Uh, third, uh, the region's institutions are not yet uh, as mature as those uh, of its, uh, the comparable ones in the West. We need to continue to strengthen those uh, institutions. One of the things we learned in the Asian crisis uh, in the late 90s is that the central banks should be fully empowered, should be independent, and should be professional. And a lot of us learned that lesson, mm. and we're now much better. Mm. A lot of us are much better for it. And I think we need to uh, look at that. Now, examples of uh, uh, where we need uh, uh, reforms. Let me take uh, the case of our uh, country. Uh, the, press, uh, the Philippines was a laggard for a long time. In fact, the story of the last four years is a comeback story of the Philippines to one of the leaders uh, in the region now because of better governance. Governance is, I think, uh, the most important ingredient uh, because businesses want predictability, want an open uh, uh, economy, want to be able to reduce the risk so that they just focus on market risk. Yes. So in the case of the Philippines, corruption is a big uh, challenge. Bureaucracy is a challenge. The president basically uh, said that uh, we will have, we'll launch a war against this. And as we're speaking, we are in the midst of that uh, war. We impeach a cheap justice. We uh, are Im imposing a, a new way of dealing in, with bureaucracy, basically an incentive-based uh, uh, system. In the Bureau of Customs, where you know uh, the second largest uh, uh, revenue-generating agency that we have, we put in a good team. We remove basically the top uh, uh, team. We're using information to drive uh, performance, we're empowering them with technology, we're rationalizing the process, we're fast-tracking the national single window so that we can connect with the ASEAN single uh, window. Yeah. These are examples of reforms. Uh, another one would be opening up markets. No? We, can never, we cannot protect a few at the expense of many. Mm. Uh, in uh, integration, in open markets, there will be losers. But the hope is that because of in the investments and natural strengths of countries, you will have winners uh, also. So what countries need to do is not be afraid to do that. Help those who will be affected by helping them adjust, workers training, and uh, the others, and then continue to march uh, towards uh, uh, more connectedness. Okay. All right, don't mean to be rude, but this sounds like your op-ed piece yesterday. Yeah. But getting back to the original question, where do you sense there is stalling or slippage in terms of reforms? It doesn't have to be in the Philippines, but, but just generally in this part of the world. Well, um, 20 years ago, we were challenging with fiscal issues. A major component of that uh, problem was uh, fuel subsidies. Yeah. Uh, there are areas uh, th uh, where we have subsidies as well. We must resist the uh, populist uh, uh, tendencies 
to, to uh, support certain sectors that can end up being a, a black hole, okay. a financial black hole. Uh, pensions mm. is uh, another. We have a positive uh, uh, de uh, demography right now, but that can, can come back to haunt us. We must deal with the problem uh, uh, okay. early on. A rise in the case of the Philippines. Mm. We have a quantitative restriction. We have a very high tariff. Mm -hmm. We need to open it up. Uh, okay, I tell you what, let's, let's yeah. move along. I mean, talking about doing the right things for your yeah. economy yeah. and with regards to subsidies as well, Indonesia, Bakati, uh, we all know, did something pretty tough. And this is something that's politically very sensitive uh, for your country. Fuel subsidies, you basically, you basically cut them. You hiked interest rates very aggressively. And now, lo and behold, you're no longer really one of the fragile five, are you? Yes, I think what we did last year was uh, quite difficult for us. The first one when we decided to choose stabilization over growth um, at the expense of the slowing down of our economy. We raised the interest rate by 175 basis point. We adjusted the fuel price by 44% and we slowed down the growth. But I think this is good to provide a good uh, ground for mm. our macroeconomic stability. And as you see now that, you know, the financial sector is much more stable. Yeah. Our current account deficit is in the better shape. But I think, Martin, this is not enough. Because if we're talking about Indonesia in the medium term, we cannot continue only by focusing on the tightening cycle, the counter-cyclical or fiscal or the monetary. I think I agree with what Cesar said. Um, in the medium term, we need to expand this country by supporting on the supply side. And if you're talking about supply side, the main critical issues for Indonesia, the first one is quite similar with Philippines, is infrastructure, especially related to the issue of the you know, land clearing, land procuring, because we didn't have the eminent domain law before. This would be the big issue. Fortunately, by 2015, we will have this uh, land bill. The second one is the quality of human resources. Because I don't think the country like Indonesia can continue to rely on their natural resources or the cheap labor. Yeah. So I think we need to move into this you know, uh, knowledge-based economy, good quality of human capital. OK, I want to stop you here. I mean, it's all well and fine talking about these things that Indonesia uh, has already done, and laudably so, and the things that uh, are, are yet to come. But the reality is, in terms of continuity, really nobody knows. Isn't that true? Because come a month, what are we talking about? A month, month and a half's time, there's gonna be a new government. You may not be the finance minister anymore, likely won't be. How confident are you that the things that you've done under the SBY administration, will the reforms, will endure, can last, can continue? One thing that I learned on the decision-making process, usually when approaching the election, you know, the politician always come up with this political gimmick in order to get a popular su support. But let me perhaps talk with the number, Martin. Whoever become the president in Indonesia in order to gain the you know, political support, both, you know, both candidates need to provide growth in order to create jobs to reduce poverty. Mm. And if you want to provide jobs, you need investment. In Indonesia now, 1% growth requires about 5.3% investment over GDP. So if you want to grow by 7% in order to reduce poverty, you need investment probably around 38%. Unfortunately, our domestic savings now is only 32. There is no way Indonesia could achieve 7% growth if this not supported by the foreign capital. So my point is, whoever become a president, once they are in power later on, they will be you know, constrained by the economic national uh, economic rationality to become the market friendly. I want to get your comments on this very quickly. We managed to spend some time with one of Indonesia's uh, top tycoons, whom, whom I won't name, but I asked him point blank uh, whether it's Jokowi Kala, that ticket, or, 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 or anybody else. Indonesia's new president, the new administration, what is their number one priority, their top priority going to be? And bluntly, he told me, surviving two terms, getting reelected for another term. Does it, is it fair to say that it takes that long to get reforms through in Indonesia? Well, I think the first, <clears throat> um, the first things that we need to do is to ensure the political stability. 
I think the president, SBY, had set the tone by having two terms and put the political stability, so allow us to do some reforms. I think for the next president, it's quite similar. The more focus is similar, quite, uh, quite similar with Philippines, is on infrastructure, as I said to you, then, you know, on the issue of the human capital. And need somehow, uh, sort of like supported by good governance and also the strong government. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Secretary, back to you just very quickly. You've got, uh, I think, no noise administration. You're part of it, obviously, has, what is it, three years left, right? So you're halfway through a, half. a second term. A lot of people would look at that position and go, uh oh, lame duck. How much more can you get done in terms of reforms in your remaining time? The good thing about uh, President Aquino is extremely popular. So he has the political capital to make sure that in the last two years of his term, he's able to follow through yeah. on the reforms in the first. Uh, uh, four years. In fact, as we speak, we have several major um, legislation in Congress. Uh, new uh, charter for the Banco Central, uh, customs modernization law, uh, rationalization of incentives, so on and so forth. So I think uh, we will see this uh, uh, true. And uh, as you know, uh, I think uh, what's happened the past four years also in the Philippines... Is 60-40 going to change? I'm sorry? Is 60-40 going to change in your well, remaining three years? Well, the, there is a bill uh, right now in Congress that uh, will further open up uh, uh, the economy that will not require a constitutional change. Ah. So I think uh, in a change process, uh, you have steps. No? And uh, we're still in the early part of, uh, of uh, the change uh, agenda. There mm -hmm. are things that we can still do without uh, mm -hmm. uh, tampering with the uh, Constitution. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think our focus is to make sure that uh, we use the political capital for the maximum immediate uh, uh, mm -hmm. benefit. Mm -hmm. And as I was uh, saying, uh, President Aquino's uh, main achievement, I think, is uh, really in the empowerment of people, to reverse apathy to one of uh, uh, ownership. And I think uh, this is ultimately what's going to make sure mm -hmm. that the changes he's done in the country will be continued beyond uh, his term. We have an empowered citizenry who has access to information through mobile telephony and uh, uh, the internet. You know, we've seen changes in the world that we never thought we'd seen in a, see in our lifetime. Mm. I mean, regimes that we thought will be there forever, but they're gone, mainly because people now are empowered. And I think the biggest gain in the Philippines the past four years is people know the impact of good governance on their own lives, that they actually have better potential, they have better chances of actualizing their dreams mm. with good governance. And I think they're going to push for that. Okay, and you, I mean, you've made the point before that good governance is also good economics. Exactly. Correct? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chu, let me bring you in, or, or rather, Victor. You know, one of the things that this part of the world is worried about, economies in this part of the world, and policymakers, of course, is, is what happens with uh, the U.S. We've been through this whole taper tantrum. Right, things have stabilized, but we are drawing closer to the, uh, the Fed getting out of the QE business and that first uh, rate hike. In addition to that, there's also China mm -hmm. slowing down. Mm -hmm. You're based in Hong Kong, of course. You've got a pretty good perspective on what's going on there. One school of thought says China slowing down is good. It is making a choice between growth and stability. It is choosing stability because we do want China to be around mm -hmm. in the next 30, 40, 50, 100 years. Right? And, and more. And more. And, the yeah. other school thinks, uh-oh, there's so much debt as well as hidden debt, this is a financial time bomb waiting to basically implode. Which is it? Uh, if I could uh, say that I, my learned friend from the Philippines, I, I think the, the formula with uh, growth plus economic reform plus uh, inclusive and sustainable growth, yeah. I think that's brilliant. I, I would add one more, and we need regional stability and peace. I think that's, from an investor's point of view, I think that is number one. Um, whether, I mean, the tapering, the um, <clears throat> uh, rising financing costs around the world, all these, we know about this. Mm. I mean, it's not going to come as a shock. It will have some impact uh, to the emerging market. Mm. But long-term investors are completely convinced on the long-term macro fundamentals here. But all the, all the macro reform agenda that we talk about, we know about, we know it has to be done, mm -hmm. is going to be distracted if we don't have stability either in individual countries or regional peace. Yeah. I think that's the, number one, that's the number one thing. Chinese debt is, right now, is containable because mm -hmm. we call, I mean, shadow banking is, is actually the wrong um, terminology. We're really talking about the secondary banking sector, the non-bank financial institution. The good thing is the Chinese government 
got to grips with it fairly early on. So it, as a percentage to the, to the system, is manageable. And also, we can't assume every single debt from this secondary banking se sector is bad. They're not. Only a fraction of it is bad, okay. and one has to deal with it. And that is actually is a worldwide phenomenon. That's part of the legacy problem we inherit from the, from the crisis. Mm. We have a massive stimulus. And of course, now we have to deal with the, the aftermath of that, mm. right? And that's the same thing. The longer we have zero interest rate, the more painful it will be at the back end, right? But you can't really withdraw the, the low interest rate right now because the recovery in Japan, in America, in Europe, it's still quite fragile, mm. right? Now, East Asia depends on three, three big blocks, China, Japan, and US, right? Japan, the first two arrows has been very successful. Japan is back, it's back on the radar screen. There's the dynamism, you know, you know activity, energy. Well, well, for how long is the question? Well, exactly. Without that third arrow. Exactly. Yeah. The third, fourth, and fifth will need help. And yeah. Japan also needs stability as well, mm. because if, if the regional conflicts are, are not resolved in a rational, sensible manner, it's going to be distracted in uh, Japan's economic reform. Okay, well. Let me stop you there, Victor. I have two questions uh, with regards to your first point, uh, uh, regional stability uh, mm -hmm. uh, and security. What really do you think, personally, mm -hmm. right, and I have to make a distinction, you're based in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. right? what really are China's intentions it's not in the South China Sea? No, no, there's no... Um, it's not China's uh, intention. I mean, these are very complicated issues when you're dealing with uh, econo exclusive economic zones because they, they overlap, and there's no, no perfect answer. It has to be something that one has to sit down and, through a process, uh, sort it out for mutual, mutual interest in the long term. Mm. Right? And, um, <clears throat> and it, now, we have a window here because the way that economic economic impacts, there's a delay reaction. What happens today will manifest in six, nine, 12 months' time. We have a window here that when the dust is settled, excitement is settled, mm. people have to sit down and find a solution. Okay. I'm saying this as an investor in the region, right? Because otherwise, and I go for the safe havens in, uh, in, in, in elsewhere, mm. but I'm convinced on the macroeconomic dynamics here, long term, but the million dollar question is, we have to see their efforts from all sides mm. to come to census, talk, and be, be able to find something. With regards to the South China Sea. Yes, the question. difficulty is okay. everybody is now looking at, at their, their domestic economics, the domestic politics at play, yeah. their changes of government, and um, but once all that is settled, people can, can sit down and talk. Okay, interesting. Now, uh, Cesar, I want to bring you in on this because obviously the Philippines is, is, as it were, taking the fight to the Chinese. You've taken your case to, to The Hague. I mean, that is a, to be blunt, it's a pretty ballsy thing to do. Well, we're not taking the uh, fight. This is really a recognition of the fact that the relationship among countries have many dimensions. Mm. And the um, territorial dimension cannot be the end all and be all of the relationship. In fact, uh, it was the Chinese leader himself who said that the sum of our relationship you know, must not just be about this issue. It must be the other dimensions as well. And I think that's what we've seen uh, uh, the past uh, few years. Our trade relationships continue to grow. Our tourism uh, continue to uh, mm. uh, improve. Our people-to-people, -people, cultural exchanges continue to uh, uh, grow. And I think that should be the uh, focus. Even countries you know, that are uh, do, you know, have a lot of trade, U.S. and Canada, mm. they have issues that where they've agreed to disagree and put it aside. Taiwan and China, they've had issues, and yet trade and investment relationship is uh, uh, booming. So we cannot be uh, distracted with the one uh, issue or a disagreement on an issue. Trade business must go on. I think we'll we have to on. have a, yes, I think we have to have a holistic uh, mm. uh, view uh, of the situation. Yeah. In today's uh, interconnected uh, uh, mm -hmm. world, uh, we cannot uh, uh, you know, just be fixated mm. on uh, one uh, aspect because yeah. we are so interdependent mm. of each other. The clothes we wear, the, the, the electronics we have, it's not made in one country. Mm. It's made in many countries. And therefore, we have to learn how to uh, work with each other under 
uh, international rules. Mm -hmm. under, so, and that's why I think uh, that's our safe harbor. Tony Fernandez, let me bring you in. What is your sense of things? We've, got, we've talked about some of the risks overhanging this part of the world. Rates in the U.S. rising, maybe sooner or faster than, than we expected. That, that's one risk. You've got the geopolitics, South, uh, South China Seas, et cetera. You run a low-cost airline. You're doing extremely well. Does any of this matter to you? Yeah. <clears throat> well, wars matter, by the way. But um, very highbrow on that side of the table, very yeah. complicated, very smart people. So make it simple for us. This is a, the full service uh, part of the airline <laughs> industry. I'll give you the simple, low cost all answers. Right, all right. Number one, I think, um, uh, as, as Victor said, uh, we have a lot of people in this part of the world. The fundamentals are definitely going our way. The consumption is going to rise, economies are going to grow. Uh, I think there's a you know, wonderful opportunity, and if I can focus on Southeast Asia for a little bit, in that, um, in, in your topic of growth, uh, there's an opportunity for the private industry, private sector to really pump that up. And I think governments should allow uh, businesses to grow and facilitate business as being involved too much in business. I think the uh, potential of the ASEAN economic community is massive. Mm. You have a six to 700 million population there. And if you can dismantle some of the national interests sorry, some of the vested interests, and put national interests ahead, the potential for ASEAN businesses to grow mm. is, is enormous. Mm. Uh, if you can dismantle some of the barriers, make cost of business lower, um, the potential is huge. You take AirAsia, we started this airline uh, 12 years ago with two planes, carried 200,000 passengers in the first year. We have now grown over the last 12 years to 160 planes and carry 50 million passengers. Most of that growth has come through ASEAN by connecting communities that weren't connected. 80% mm. uh, of our routes are new routes that were never done before in ASEAN. So, so, so let me ask you, I mean, with AEC, the ASEAN Economic Community Single Common Market, which is supposed to happen next year, 2015, uh, we're supposed to see exactly that, more interconnectedness, right? Lower barriers, freer flow of goods, trade services, people, et cetera. Does that apply for aviation as well? Well, I think we're moving in the right direction. I think uh, open skies, there are a couple of countries that haven't ratified the open skies yet, but it's uh, moving in the right direction. Certainly, you know, from 12 years ago, uh, connectivity has improved dramatically, uh, but there's a lot still to be done, in my opinion, in terms of really opening it up, because open skies is one thing, but there are many invisible barriers that still exist. You can have open skies and then the airport says I've got no slots anymore. True, yeah, infrastructure. Um, we get but back the to national that again. airline gets all the slots as well. Yeah. So I think if we really, and, and there's a disconnect, I think, between what policymakers and what private industry think. Mm -hmm. And I think a big drive for policymakers is to engage the private industry more mm -hmm. and see the reality. I think mm -hmm. there's lots of conventions, lots yeah. of statements coming out from ASEAN. Yeah. Um, everyone feels good, a lot of bullish statements. But the reality is something different. Mm. And um, I think communication has to grow between the private sector okay. and uh, government. All right, Cesar and also Bakati, I want to put both of you on the spot. With regards to aviation, I know for a fact that neither the Philippines nor Indonesia have signed on to open skies yet. Why? Well, uh, first, I'd like to point out that the president uh, made uh, skies outside Metro Manila. Uh, uh, open sky, so that's what we call uh, pocket uh, open sky. And the challenge really is congestion in Manila. So we need to fix uh, first the uh, infrastructure uh, bottleneck in the aviation industry. Uh, we would like to have more connections, and we thank uh, Tony uh, for connecting uh, cities in the Philippines now to the rest of uh, the region. And we've seen the benefits. Um, as, I, uh, as the tourism secretary said, our tourism numbers have increased 60% since mm -hmm. President uh, uh, Aquino. Uh, secondly, I think uh, uh, in all the ASEAN countries, you must re realize that they operate in a political environment. And therefore, uh, change must be done in a manner mm -hmm. where you continue to bring the people with you. Okay. And there must be steps. Now, we can, uh, sometimes we are lucky we take uh, big steps, no? but uh, it's okay to take uh, small steps so mm -hmm. that uh, you continue to move in the right uh, uh, direction okay. and have the support. So the, the bottom population. line is infrastructure has to catch up first before open skies, before uh, you sign on to open skies. Yeah, skies. because uh, okay. if you just have congestion, then yeah. you'll have problems. What's so the we'll... point? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Makati? Well, we have a quite similar problem uh, with Philippines, actually. Let me give an example about Sukarno-Hatta Airport. 
the capacity is only about 25 million passengers. Now it's worked for about 59 million uh, passengers. So I, I do understand that the demand is there, but need to be supported by the strong supply capacity. So talking about this infrastructure, I think this is, would be the, the first priority of the government before we can move into the, the next stage. Mm. Okay, interesting. And uh, Mr. Lee, uh, we didn't mean to leave you up. Let's bring you in on this as well. You're uh, South Korea's G20 Sherpa, but you've also, in, in a previous life, I guess, spent quite a lot of time at the fund. That's right. Uh, correct. When you've been listening into what these two gentlemen here, the policymakers, have been, have been talking about, what is your sense? Because what I see is, what I, what I worry about is, in the case of both the Philippines as well as Indonesia, is developing economies which may be focused a little bit too much on the consumption or consumer end of development, not having fully developed the middle part, manufacturing, heavy industry, et cetera, or for that matter, maximized agriculture as well. It, do you read it that way as well or not? Well, if you look at the development history in the last two decades or so, what happened was there was a shift of manufacturing base from the advanced countries to the EM countries, particularly to Asia. What has happened is the product market, the purchasing power there, has lagged behind in terms of shift to EM countries. During the, uh, the years following the, Asian, uh, the global financial crisis, because Asia's economic growth was faster than the advanced economies, there was indeed some acceleration of the shift of the purchasing power. For Asia to remain on a sustainable path and remain the uh, engine of uh, global growth, you need to have a system that allows the continuous growth of the middle income group because ultimately what drives an economic growth is on the demand side is the desire for improved living standard by the many. And for that, you need to have a system that ensures, and for that, you need to have a uh, system that re reduces income inequality because income inequality essentially is a, an end product where for many reasons, the wealth of the system ends up with the few, mm. and thus the demand potential is reduced. Um, so, but that's on the demand side. On the supply side, you need, of course, a innovate, continuous innovation that, particularly the coming decade or so, uh, you need an innovation system that allows less or efficient, more efficient use of energy resources because mm. as more middle income groups come into the stream, natural resources are limited, and thus you need a technology that will enable uh, the natural resources to support the growing middle income group. So essentially two. One, a system that allows the growth of the middle income group in Asia. Two, mm. innovation that allows more efficient use of natural resources. Okay. All right. Hold that thought, Mr. Lee. We'll come back and talk more as uh, when we uh, come back. We're going to take a quick break. When we continue, we'll talk about growth without leaving too many people behind after this. World Economic Forum East Asia talking about growth, how we're going to get more of it, where it's going to come from, and what governments and also the private sector can do to help. And we left off, uh, Mr. Lee, you were talking about, uh, I mean, what's important is uh, that growth not leave uh, too many people uh, behind. And Secretary Purissima, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but simply because the numbers are there. Uh, the turnaround in the Philippines is remarkable. You've called it basically the comeback kid, or the comeback story of the last uh, decade or so. Yet, your poverty levels are still alarmingly high. Unemployment is probably the highest in the region. 
It's not just absolute points. Relatively as well, rich, poor gap, disparities have not improved. Why? Well, not exactly. Uh, the numbers have improved. Uh, there's been a 3 percentage point improvement. That's all, almost 2.6 million uh, uh, people. No? Uh, obviously, we need to continue and follow uh, through. Uh, there are uh, need for sectoral uh, interventions, in particular in agriculture. 30% of our people are in agriculture, and yet it only produces 12% of our GDP. Mm. And here, infrastructure, again, plays a role. Uh, drying facilities, storage facilities, irrigation, uh, uh, you know, we need to invest uh, in this area. We, give them, we need to give them access to better uh, technology, access to financing. We need to improve their productivity. Mm. If we succeed in doing that, we improve the overall competitiveness of the country because food costs become cheaper, push on wages becomes less. Mm. So agriculture is going to be an important uh, uh, area of intervention for the country. The other is manufacturing. Uh, just like uh, Mr. Lee uh, uh, mentioned, uh, manufacturing in the Philippines is important because it is the one sector that will give the lesser skilled Filipinos a high, uh, good quality uh, jobs. The good news is that of late, light manufacturing has been doing well uh, in the Philippines. We've seen an influx of uh, particular Japanese uh, light industry come to uh, Manila. And I think uh, what we need to do again to make sure that this is sustained and it even grows faster is infrastructure. Power mm -hmm. cost is uh, high in the country because of legacy uh, issues. We need to lower the power costs. Mm -hmm. We need to improve ports. We need to uh, have better roads and mass uh, uh, transit. And the challenge, as I said, is infrastructure. How infrastructure, much can you get done in the remaining three years? Well, I think what's important is we set the foundations so that it can be sustained. It will never be done in six years. You know? Philippines was number two to Japan uh, in the early 60s. Uh, it took us 40 years to get to the bottom, and I think uh, uh, it will take uh, some time to get back up. But the important thing is we're pointed in the right direction, and the opportunity is there, and it's coming at the right time. Yeah. And that's why we're uh, optimistic mm -hmm. about the future of the, the country. We have the right leadership. Mm -hmm. We have the right demography, we're in the right location, the most dynamic economic region uh, of the world. And uh, I think uh, it's coming at a time when there's an opportunity to leapfrog to the mm. technology. Mm. Interesting. I want to go off on a slight tangent here and get into the politics uh, yeah. of it. Uh, both the Philippines and also, of course, Indonesia, no stranger to, to coups. I mean, look, they've happened before. Just days ago in Thailand, the military took over. But no, it's not a coup. Does it really matter? Well, I think, I think the political stability is important, um, Martin. But I think uh, we also learn from the history, you know, once the market more mature, the business, you know, move into a certain direction, then there is a sort of like separation between the political activities and then economic activities. But somehow, you know, this needs to be supported by the political stability as well. Mm -hmm. I don't want to give a comment about what's been happening in Thailand, but I think, you know, uh, political stability is something uh, necessary for, the, you know, for uh, um, providing the good economic growth. Okay, let me ask you another question. I mean, uh, we know as in the Philippines, infrastructure build out and rule out is essential. One of the key reforms in Indonesia and the next government has to continue uh, uh, d down the road on. Um, Another reform that not a lot of people talk about these days, or I haven't heard that much talk about it, is what's going on with the military. We know there was legislation many years ago to get them out of business. Is the military in Indonesia right now out of business? Because, I mean, the risks are, you know, you compete for everything, including funding, if the military is in business. I will say that we are moving into the right direction, because if you recall what happened to Indonesia during the Suharto era, uh, we have this, you know, a role of the strong role of the military in business. But now with the improvement of the governance, etc., I think uh, we put everything on the balance sheet now at the state budget. So I think uh, on this particular issue, I think Indonesia is making a progress, a lot of progress compared to what we had 16 years ago. Yeah. Um, there are some, you know, involvement of the military in the business, but it's go through, it's like the business process. It's more on a transparent and on budget now. Mm. If you had to put a number on it, I mean, how much has the military retreated from business? Oh, since I would, that, I would since say that very significant. It's more than 80%. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's quite significant, actually. Okay, interesting. Cesar, does it matter to you when you 
saw the news, the headlines a few days ago. Military took over in Thailand, but no, they're not calling it a coup. <laughs> well, politics matters. Um, but I think what we need to realize in this region is that we do have old societies here, but young countries. And uh, that's part of the maturation uh, process of uh, uh, democracies and countries that are adjusting to it. And I think the important uh, uh, point here is that it highlights the value of a more integrated uh, ASEAN. Because companies actually want to manage uh, risk. And therefore, uh, in, in dealing with these uh, challenges, I think companies now realize that if they're more diversified, mm. then they're better able to deal with risk, whether due to political issues or climate change or other uh, uh, factors. And that is where the strength of a more integrated ASEAN... So, uh, so in other words, what you're saying is basically more open, freer movement of goods, uh, services, capital, yeah. people, etc., yeah. would allow uh, economies as well yeah. as countries yeah. to literally, physically, vroom, work around yeah. situations like, let's say, Thailand. Yeah, and our own experience when we were hit with Typhoon uh, Haiyan, uh, the BPO companies in the Typhoon hit the areas were able to move their processing in the areas not uh, hit by Typhoon uh, Haiyan. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how uh, uh, it should be. And I think uh, the one good thing about the challenges that we face, uh, the Philippines faced challenges in the, in the 70s and 80s uh, also, and it did affect us. Mm -hmm. no? So the one thing good is that we're learning from this, mm -hmm. that we need political stability to, uh, stability to be able to attract uh, uh, businesses. Because yeah. businesses don't want additional risk. Mm -hmm. It's tough already to compete in the market. Yeah. But they don't want further complication. And I think that's where uh, you know, all of us uh, should focus on, make sure mm -hmm. that we create a stable uh, uh, platform for Tony, business. Tony, obviously you do business in Thailand. Uh, when you heard the news, uh, military taking over, but no, not a coup, what was your first reaction? Did you go, oh, no, not again? No, we thought it was a great opportunity to uh, let people see what tanks are on the streets. <laughs> so we're promoting uh, around ASEAN to say go to Thailand and, and see what a coup that's not a coup is like. <laughs> <laughs> so there's always an opportunity. There's a... But seriously. But, but seriously, no, I mean, you know, we've been through a lot over the last 12 years, uh, a lot in Thailand as well. But... I think there is a little bit of a, again, it's a slight disconnect. I think people are a little bit immune, and business goes on. Um, we haven't seen any slowdown in numbers at all. People are, are still flying to Thailand. It's, it's a great place to go to. And um, with, with the sharp end, you'd, you'd see it first mm. in our business. So I think there is a strong resilience. And I think that is um, very prevalent in Southeast Asia because we've been through a lot of crises. Mm. People are battle-hardened here and we're quite adept at dealing with uh, situations. For, so at this point, I mean, when there were lots of demonstrations and riots, and then yes, it affected. Sure. Um, but actually, when there's a little bit of stability, I mean, right now there is a little bit uh, with the army coming out, we actually see the numbers increasing, which is, which is bizarre. Your numbers are increasing? In Thailand, yes. Oh, um, so, uh, you know, it is a little bit of a dichotomy, but. That's, the, that's a fact. A bit of irony as well. Just okay. if I could just go back on, when you, on, on equalization of people, I think two things governments have to look at as well is education and health. I think these are two things that, you know, everyone talks about infrastructure, infrastructure, but these are, are important parts of infrastructure, the mm. human capital mm. part of uh, um, infrastructure. And I think education must be freely available um, and must be focused, skills-driven, et cetera. And I think... Technology can play a big part in it because education infrastructure is expensive mm -hmm. and trying to provide education and pay for it, et cetera. Um, and I think technology and what you're seeing with Khan Academies, et cetera, mm -hmm. leads governments a tremendous opportunity to give access to its people, mm. uh, uh, education at much lower cost, and then productivity increases okay. as, as people are more educated. And I think health is also very important. There's a big gap between the state system and, and private health, yeah. um, and the state system will always be burdened because you know, and that, that's freer. So but that needs opportunity. There for must the be opportunities well. for something in between. You know, yeah. a low-cost health system. Yeah. You know, what does that mean? Are we going to charge you for oxygen when you come in, or uh, you know, give you half a Panadol? <laughs> but I think innovation has an, there's an opportunity to do that. But I think it's very important that governments see that part of this infrastructure development must include education mm. and health. And health care. Okay. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back here at the World Economic Forum East Asia.
Welcome back. We're here at the World Economic Forum in East Asia talking about uh, growth. And Tony Fernandez, just a few seconds ago, was telling us about how when we talk about uh, reforms and, and infrastructure, we also have to, we can't forget, uh, health care and also uh, education. And Secretary, you had some thoughts on that. No, I fully agree with uh, uh, Tony. Uh, education is a great equalizer. That's exactly what uh, uh, President Aquino is doing. Since his term, uh, we've uh, almost doubled the education budget. We've more than doubled the health care uh, uh, budget, and more importantly, the conditional cash transfer program, the program that we have that gives stipends to the poorest of the poor to keep their children in school and bring them to health center, we've increased it sixfold. Mm -hmm. And uh, now we're working with the private sector, we're looking at the apprenticeship model of uh, Germany to see how we can introduce that in the Philippines so that we have better match between the skills we produce and the skills that industry uh, mm -hmm. I need. So infrastructure, human infrastructure, I think we really need to invest uh, in here. Because for example, in the case of the Philippines, mm. if we are to realize the demographic dividend, mm. we have to educate our people. Okay, no, necessary as well as noble. Where's the money going to come from, though? You've done fantastic work uh, in terms of fiscal consolidation, but all these plans are going to require uh, revenues, and you do have a very, a very narrow tax base. Well, um, since uh, President Aquino took office, we've increased the fiscal space. Uh, principally by reducing the cost of uh, interest uh, from the reducing debt to GDP that uh, uh, we have, but better utilization of our resources, mm -hmm. less in uh, inefficiency, less corruption, mm -hmm. and uh, introduction of zero-based budgeting. Okay. Uh, so we've been able to get more out of uh, limited resources. Okay, interesting. You know, we've been talking about uh, healthcare slash welfare reform, infrastructure, and uh, Secretary uh, Purissima just referred to it, uh, corruption or anti-corruption and reform of, I guess that, that also means in many cases, reform of the civil service, the public service as well. Three key reforms that any government, new government in Indonesia will also have to tackle. If it is the Jokowi Kala ticket, how much movement are we going to see on all three fronts? Well, before I, I answer your question, Martin, perhaps let me give some background behind it and I'm and later on, I'm hoping you forget about your question to me about <laughs> um, First is, let me give the, the global context first. What, what's, what will be the face of the global economy in the future? The first one is, if you're looking at the global situation with the US and the Europe having a deficit on the current account and the fiscal, I do believe that the rebalancing must take place. Because US one day, they'll become an exporter. They become a savers rather than spenders. Then the question is, what will be the locomotive of trade? It's no longer in the advanced country, but will be in Asia. But unfortunately, the problem in many Asian countries, you know, we still have facing a problem about inequality, urbanization. So that is why those issues regarding this healthcare, education, access for education, infrastructure become very crucial. Because if Asia fail to address this issue, then you know, we cannot rely on the advanced country because later on, they will change their role as the locomotive of trade. It will shift to Asia, but Asia is not ready yet. So this is the burden for every leaders in Asia. Mm. They must deliver this kind of reform. Then let me take your question about Djokovic. Thank you. I think the most important one, I'm not referring specifically to him, but his looking at the approval rate is quite popular. One thing that, you know, it's very important is if you deliver your policy, you get a political support. If you get a political support, it must be easier. Because if I recall what happened with the IMF in Indonesia back in 1998, <clears throat> the program itself was pretty good. But since they didn't get the political support, people do not have the ownership of the program. But if you have you know, a leader with get a political support, and I think it's much easier for you to deliver all this issue about health care, about access for education. Mm -hmm. We'll see whether Jokowi will win the election or not. His approval rate showing that he's quite popular. But I think whoever be, uh, um, is winning the election, I think it's very important to get this political support. Not a fair question. A lot of people make uh, much of his uh, local and provincial experience, but really wonder whether that can translate on a national stage, whether you know someone who was a governor now uh, was a governor of J Jakarta, and then before that, uh, Solo, whether he can govern an entire uh, country. Do you share those concerns? I think the best answer to this is we need to wait. 
But this is my experience in doing the reform, Martin. Sometimes people are tempted to do to the uphill battle. But I think the best way to do reform is just to provide a success story. When you provide a success story, you gain the political credibility. Once you gain the political credibility, you get a political support. And much easier to go to another reform. In the case of Jokowi, he's been quite successful in the case of Solo. So he, he provides a success story. I think that's the reason why people sort of like giving support to him. Mm. So we don't need to talk about the radical reform in the national level. As long as you can provide the success story, that could be a sort of like, you know, uh, a start mm. to move into the, uh, another reform. Well, would it be fair to say that he's actually introduced uh, during his provincial regional uh, time uh, healthcare or insurance cards? I remember that. Also, he cleaned up or streamlined government processes. Isn't that a pretty decent sort of precedent to, to bring with you into office? Well, on the, on the healthcare issue, I think uh, we need to look at this issue carefully because if you're talking about welfare system, <clears throat> it's not always easy. Mm. Yeah, Indonesia now is, experience, uh, is experimenting also with the you know, social security uh, welfare system. And I think we need to look at more carefully. But when you mentioned about this, you know, uh, sort of like streamlining the regulation, simplifying the process, I think uh, he made a case for the case in Solo. Hmm, hmm, okay. Uh, you talked about your social security system. I know this legislation is pending. It should go through sometime this year, correct? And uh, for folks that are not uh, into this, it's been described by some people as what's going to be as, uh, the healthcare part of it, the largest single payer program in the world, 250 million people, and it's gonna require a lot of revenue. As a Minister of Finance, I would say that we have to move step by step because one of my concerns is if you learn from the you know, uh, welfare system all over the world, the problem is unfunded. Mm -hmm. The other one is we, have, we need to look at about the composition of the demography as well. Once the country move into the situation in which that's with the aging populations, it's become a burden. Mm -hmm. So what I can say about this, I think we need to uh, look at this issue carefully, move step by step, and ensure this is fiscally funded. Mm -hmm. Interesting, Victor, you've been silent for, for quite a while. Come on on this, weigh in on this. Well, I think in, in China too, yeah. I think a similar issues uh, apply. I think it's anti-corruption, healthcare, clean air, safety of food, livelihood issue, major infrastructure, in, a major uh, investment in quality infrastructure. Mm. So I think the, I mean, regionally, the, the, the agenda are very similar, interestingly. The agenda is very similar. How they execute is very uh, different though. In China's case, yeah. we have a still uh, central command control economy and the Communist Party, does that make it easier or harder? Sometimes it's easier, sometimes it's harder. Okay. I think um, one of the interesting um, uh, uh, stories now we are seeing is why are we seeing a major anti-corruption uh, campaign? It's really there's a lot of blockages uh, uh, imposed by vested interests, right? and that makes execution um, inefficient. Right, to put it in a, in a very elegant way. Um, and, uh, and also you see these special zones coming up in Shanghai and later on in Tianjin, Beijing. Again, it's going to cut red tape mm. so that um, certain areas in China can benchmark to international uh, uh, standards. And then you have um, the recent uh, city. The whole group is being transferred to Hong Kong to be subjected to Hong Kong and therefore international investor scrutiny, mm -hmm. subject to international listing rules and, and rules, of, rules of law. Mm -hmm. So again, that's very bold as a macro uh, um, reform. Mm -hmm. and, and I hope uh, we'll, we'll continue. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we need to take a quick break, but a lot more to talk about as we continue here at the World Economic Forum East Asia.
Welcome back. Uh, you're still with us here at the World Economic Forum East Asia. We're talking about growth and the way forward in a growth-challenged uh, world. Uh, Mr. Lee, let me uh, bring you in on uh, this. Uh, what, uh, what I basically want to talk to you about is uh, from your experience in the past uh, at the fund and looking at the sort of uh, way the trade is developing out in this part of the world. You've got two competing models, or models that are trying to compete against each other, TPP, RCEP. Right, uh, multilateral system is pretty much uh, broken down. Both of these gentlemen here represent countries, Mr. Purisima, Akatib, uh, which have not been very keen to sign on to the TPP. China happens to be Indonesia's number one trading partner right now. So uh, it seems as though both economies are very much already in the RCEP or, or, or China camp. Is that necessarily a good thing? Well, you know, TPP and RCEP both mega FTAs, but they aim for different things. TPP essentially is aiming not only for freer trade in terms of merchandise trade exchange, but also to establish common standards um, and regulations governing procurement issues and so on. So it's more focused on advanced economies as well as EM economies to facilitate not only exchange of uh, merchandise trade, but the whole F, uh, capital flows, labor flows, and exchange of ideas. So it's uh, probably a higher standard than what we are trying to aim for in the RCEP. Because in, RCEP, in Asia, as you know, the, it's a very diverse group of countries, different stages of economic growth. So what we need to achieve within Asia for, is initially a closer economic integration, acknowledging the different stages of economic development. And, achieve, and that's, I think, what RCEP is trying to do. TPP, on the other hand, is sort of a further deepening that includes the whole regulatory environment. Mm. Okay. So I think they are not competing. They should go in tandem. And as countries get ready, they can join one and alter the other. Mm. You know, Secretary, we've talked about this before when I spent time with you a couple of days ago. And we were talking about the uh, maybe not see change, but it's been a bit of a 180, has it not, for the Aquino administration in terms of your interest in uh, TPP. Now you're pretty keen on being the second wave, right? Yeah. No, in fact, uh, the president uh, expressed his interest uh, from day one. Uh, but uh, as you know, uh, they're just uh, going to the first 12 uh, countries. And we don't really know uh, how high the standard uh, will be until they have an agreement with the first 12 countries. Uh, uh, countries, but we did express our intention mm. to be part of the second uh, batch of uh, countries. So, uh, South Korea also has been knocking on the first uh, uh, batch of uh, countries. Uh, ASEAN is engaged with R RCEP. No? Mm -hmm. I think for countries like the Philippines, it's important that we be part of these uh, two large uh, uh, free trade uh, mm -hmm. agreements. Um, uh, TPP covers over half of the world's uh, uh, GDP. RCEP is also huge, no? mm. so uh, we cannot. Uh, have a competitive disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis our uh, neighboring countries. Well, Katib, you're on board. Indonesia is on board with RCEP by uh, virtue of the fact that you're part of ASEAN as well. What about TPP? I think Indonesia is, you know, um, watching this TPP process very closely. But I think there are two reasons that we need to look at carefully. The first one is if you want to join on the trade agreement, it is important to ensure that you could reap the benefit of this trade agreement. It is true while joining the trade agreement like TPP, you get a market access. But the first question is whether in the supply side, you could reap the benefit. As a colleague from Korea mentioned about this very high standard. So it's not easy, you know, for some countries, they need to sort of like to increase their capacity first. Mm -hmm. The second issue, I don't think that we can exclude China because China has become a very important trading partner in Asia, you know, most of the Southeast Asian countries, they trade with China. Mm. The second... It, it is your biggest yeah, trading partner, right? It is. Yeah. So yeah. that is why this is also a very important, you know, uh, consideration. Yeah. Because I think if you're talking about the trade agreement in the region, if China is not there, I don't think that it's not easy to sort of like, you know, because we exclude... Uh, really a big country of it. Interesting. But, uh, Victor, I mean, the, the fact of the matter is the reality is even before RCEP, uh, with the exception of, let's say, the Philippines, China is already pretty much the number one trading partner for all of Southeast Asia. I mean, even if we go down to down under to Australia and also New Zealand. Mm. Absolutely. I, I think as a multilateralist, 
um, <clears throat> I would prefer that we, we stick to the multilateral system. Because it's any not working. Re any regional bloc... It's almost dead. Uh, well, having said that, the, I mean, you will agree that the WTO is the fairest and the least discriminatory regime that we have, right? I think, unfortunately, in, in the pra practicalities of the world, we do have to have major groupings as a kind of balance, and hopefully we can benchmark ourselves towards, eventually, the reform of a better WTO or multilateral system for, to have the fairest for everybody as, as a whole. I think that's my first point. Mm -hmm. The second point is, I think it would be very unfortunate if TPP initially was being seen as a counterbalance towards the rise of China. I think that would, it would be very unfortunate if it proceeded that way. As a true trade and, um, uh, you know, giving higher benchmarks to trade, I think that's good. And I think there's now some talk in Washington that maybe they will invite China to be observer, to get China more engaged. Maybe China cannot join from day one, but eventually, you know, when the time is right, China may become part of it. And as my friend said, that would be, that would be a, a welcome uh, way for everybody. Do you realistically but, but think that could happen? It, my third point, if I may yeah. just finish, is I think TPP is still a question mark. The reason is the president does not have fast track. Yes. Right? And, and our, our trading partners here would not be able to compromise if, they, if they're not sure that the president can deliver. Mm. I mean, that's the major problem we have right now. And it's unlikely to happen uh, in, 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 the, in the near future. I mean, in, in the practical politics, realities, right? So I think that's a real point. And therefore, we may have to look at some other arrangements mm -hmm. um, to, to proceed uh, for, uh, further. Okay. Yeah. Very quickly, we're running out of time here. I want to start uh, with Victor and go right down the line. In 30 seconds or less, your growth wish list. Number one, I think we need peace and stability so that all of us can proceed with uh, macroeconomic reform, inclusive reform, sustainable reform for the benefit of everybody in East Asia. Okay, there's going to be security. Pankatim? I think the main challenge in the future is not only the sustainable of growth, but also the share of growth because the rising inequality is appearance in many Asian countries. So that is why the role of the government intervention on education, infrastructure, health is very important to ensure about the inclusive growth. Inclusiveness and narrowing the rich poor gap. Uh, Secretary? Well, uh, we need to continue uh, structural reforms. We need to continue to deepen the financial, regional financial markets. We need to increase intra Asia trade, especially in final goods, so that we're less dependent on China, Japan, and outside the uh, region. And finally, we need to invest in infrastructure to assure our connectivity within each other and with the rest of the world. Mr. Lee? Income inequality has been getting worse for the last 30 years across the globe. It was associated also with declining wage share. Though so we need a system, a re-overhaul or review of the regulatory environment to see why the wage share is declining to address the fundamental question of inequality rather than just window address through transfer payments and so on. So wow, okay, Tony. Yeah, more liberal, liberalization, opening up for markets, less uh, government to facilitate business as opposed to being involved in business. Okay. I think uh, ASEAN and Asia has tremendous opportunities because of the huge population. Uh, it is long term the place to be in, uh, allow businesses to grow by facilitating them and providing the right infrastructure. Okay, excellent. Tony, thank you. Mr. Lee, thank you. Cesar, thank you. Pak Kantib, also Victor, thank you. And thank you, folks, for watching. That's it from us here at the World Economic Forum East Asia. I'm Martin Sung. Thanks for watching.